the devil on your shoulder, your guardian angel. These are expressions that we've all heard countless times. Of course, they're not supposed to be taken literally. None of us have a heavenly spirit looking over us and protecting us from harm, in the same way that nobody really has a little red-skinned imp whispering encouragement to commit atrocious deeds in someone's ear. They're metaphors. Guardian Angel refers to any instance of seemingly divine intervention, but it's more often a coincidence that ends up benefiting a person when they need it most. And the devil on your shoulder? That's temptation. The little voice in the back of your head that sometimes eggs you on to do something you know you shouldn't. But what if there was a being that was both a demonic, malicious creature that also acted as a guardian for someone unable to protect themselves? Is it even possible for a being to be both angel and devil? And who out there could ever qualify for such holy and hellish protection? Ombre Rouge was once a fairly normal place to live, a small Louisiana town in one of the smallest of these 50 United States. Its name was derived from the French language, translating to Red Shadow, an ominous name for a township that was otherwise so uninteresting and forgettable. In fact, if things had never panned out the way they had, Ombre Rouge would have stayed that way, just a place where nothing interesting ever happened. All of that changed, of course, when the disappearances started. For anyone who might be too young to remember them, the mid-2000s were a turbulent time. The Iraq War was in full swing, and a nationwide financial crisis was rapidly approaching. But in the midst of all this global chaos and instability, the residents of Ombre Rouge were soon to be caught in the thralls of their very own shared torment. At first, like with most bad things, it started small. One person went missing, an unfortunate occurrence, but not exactly unheard of. Sadly, these things happen, especially when you live so close to the swamplands of Louisiana. People wander out into the marsh, under the searing heat of the sun, only to suffer heat stroke, collapse, and end up buried in the dark, dank mud, never to be seen again. Few of those living in the town took much notice of the first disappearance. Apart from the missing person's relatives, many just shrugged off the news. As sad as it was, most of the townsfolk were just grateful it hadn't happened to any of their own family or friends. Maybe it was that ignorance, that lack of vigilance or reaction, that meant a second resident would also be reported missing, not long after the first. But this time was different. Unlike the previous disappearance, this one had an eyewitness. Clement Donovan, known to locals as Clem, had spotted a passerby while taking out bags of garbage. This unassuming pedestrian was the second disappearance victim. Thinking little of the man who just seemed to be walking home, Clem went back inside. A split second later, he heard a scream from outside and rushed back to his dimly lit porch. It was there that Clem claimed he saw something retreating towards the nearby woods. However, Clem's wild story of something not quite human wasn't taken seriously by local police. He even managed to snap a grainy photo on his clamshell cell phone. But back in 2005, <laughs> phone cameras were nowhere near as advanced as they are today. Most Ombre Rouge locals wrote Clem off as a crazy old man at best. But worst, it made him look like someone who was trying to exploit or make light of the disappearances, something that garnered him a lot of dirty looks from his neighbors. That was until a number of other residents started reporting they had also witnessed a humanoid creature. It's hard to say if any of these eyewitnesses were genuine and how many were just people latching on to Clem's story. Regardless, the disappearances hadn't stopped, and it didn't take long for an unknown organization to roll into Ombre Rouge after hearing the rumors of a creature sighting. A few residents, even the local sheriff's department, thought these shady figures were a division of forensic specialists here to aid in the investigations into the missing persons. The more conspiratorial folks living in the town had a different explanation, that the newcomers were a deep state-controlled, top-secret government group, there to assess the possibility that there really was some kind of monster on the loose. Not long after this group had arrived in Ombre Rouge, the number of residents going missing seemed to dwindle. On the 18th of December, 2005, they packed up and left town, 
giving no explanation to the local police. Nobody knew if this secretive foundation had actually uncovered the perpetrator responsible for all the disappearances, if there even was any creature like the rumors said. But whatever had transpired in that Louisiana swamp town, one thing was clear. The moment the foundation left, nobody else went missing from Empre Rouge, or at least not for over a decade. Before then, however, little else of note happened in Ombre Rouge after the initial spate of missing persons cases. This apart from a car accident that took place just under a year after the various disappearances ended. A heavily injured man by the name of Simon Hayes was taken to a local hospital, suffering from a severe concussion. Simon had been involved in a collision with a car on the 11th of November 2006. The doctors that examined him determined that Simon had been left with short-term retrograde amnesia, a condition that affected all his memories from prior to the accident. It was due to this that he was unable to recall events that occurred in the years before he'd sustained his injuries. Now, what is it that makes a random, if unfortunate, car accident victim so significant? Well, Simon Hayes actually became the first person in Ombre Rouge to be declared missing in almost a decade. In 2016, 10 years after his accident, and 11 after the original slew of disappearances, Simon vanished when returning to his hometown in Louisiana to visit his family. Naturally, Simon Hayes wouldn't be the last familiar face to return to the town. A repetition of such similar and strange occurrences as before also brought the mysterious foundation rolling back in. Little did the townsfolk know, in the year that had followed the group's original exodus from Empre Rouge, they had lost something. On the exact same day Simon suffered his accident, whatever it was the foundation had left town with had managed to escape. Perhaps this was a purely coincidental occurrence, but what if it wasn't? After all, road traffic collisions take place all the time all over the world. But an accident happening in a town with a history of people going missing on the exact same day that this thing escaped captivity? Maybe there was a link between the two events. At the very least, the Foundation seemed to think so. Some of the more astute people living in the Swampside town noticed black armored transport vehicles moving into their neighborhoods men in body armor locking down the whole of Empre Rouge. These didn't seem like local police. They weren't even the National Guard, although they were certainly heavily armed enough to cause concern. This unit of specially trained operatives quickly took control of the entire township, their authority never questioned by the Sheriff's Department. The place was small enough, isolated by surrounding swamps and marshland, it was easy for Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 to get away with an operation like this. Before the people of Ombre Rouge had time to argue, the task force had already begun their investigation. The newest series of disappearances had started in 2016 with Simon Hayes mysteriously vanishing and had continued two years later in 2018. Just like the first bait back in 2005, there were sporadic and unconfirmed eyewitness accounts of a creature, shaped like a human but considerably taller, almost two meters in height. Most witnesses reported only ever seeing this local boogeyman at nighttime, making it much harder to see in detail, although a few seemed to state its skin was deep red, unlike any natural human skin tone. While before, residents of the Louisiana Swamp Town had brushed off stories like this as nothing more than rumors and urban legends, the Foundation seemed pretty receptive to the idea of some kind of monster on the loose in the marshland. And after all, they had good reason to believe such an outlandish story because it was the same creature that had already escaped from them in 2006. Continuing their investigation into the link between Simon Hayes and this creature, Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, also known by the codename The Village Idiots, arrived at Hayes' place of residence. Kicking the door down, breaching the house, they began a room-by-room -room sweep, looking for any clues that would explain why the monster they'd captured escaped on the same day as Simon's accident. One of the MTF operatives uncovered something, an envelope stashed in the home Simon had grown up in. He opened it cautiously. A collection of papers that were contained inside came spilling out. There were a series of simple drawings on paper that seemed to be more than a few years old. The crudeness of the hand-scrawled pictures and age of the paper seemed to imply that they had been created by a child. A number of the drawings depicted the same thing, a red-skinned creature, just like the one the townsfolk had reported seeing. With them was a note, 
written by Simon's mother, which read, Found these old drawings of yours. Thought you might like to see them again. Welcome home. There was a link, an unclear, maybe tangential connection, but one that was growing the more information the Foundation uncovered. Whatever this being was, a very young Simon Hayes had seen it while growing up in Ombre Rouge. Due to the short-term retrograde amnesia that he'd sustained after his accident, he wouldn't have remembered it, but perhaps this thing remembered him. Did that mean the pair of them might be linked somehow? Not just by coincidence, but some kind of connection that allowed the creature to escape its captivity on the exact day Simon had his car accident. A connection that had drawn Hayes back home to Ombre Rouge, or drawn the beast to Simon to kidnap him. Moving fast, MTF Epsilon-6 began to rapidly sweep the remainder of the town, searching for any further signs that would lead them to the whereabouts of either Simon Hayes or this elusive, crimson-skinned boogeyman. They interviewed residents and chased cold leads, before eventually backing their target into a corner. The Foundation's MTF operatives mapped the location of every eyewitness report of the creature, using that information to track it back to a possible point of origin. It was a barn, left abandoned, practically falling apart as it stood in a state of disrepair just outside the small Louisiana town. Under the cover of darkness, the task force approached the wooden structure, weapons locked and loaded, keeping them trained on the barn. Cautiously moving closer, remaining on high alert, the squad activated their night vision. There was a low, almost undetectable sound of movement coming from within the barn. Slowly, the MTF's leader pushed open the wooden door and peeked inside. It was there he saw what they had been looking for, the thing that had escaped the Foundation over ten years before, SCP-3631, a man and his monster. The beast was just over six feet tall, its skin a bloody shade of crimson, just as some of the eyewitnesses had described. It sported a pair of arms and bipedal legs, giving it a humanoid shape. However, that was exactly where its likeness to human beings ended. The creature, later designated as SCP-3631-1, lacked ears, eyes, or a nose, only a wide gaping maw of sharp teeth. Its face was covered in holes that twitched and puckered like smaller miniature mouths. In actuality, it used these orifices for various senses. It smelled, saw, and detected sounds through the holes in its otherwise mostly featureless face. As the members of MTF Epsilon-6 entered the barn stealthily, making sure not to alert SCP-3631-1, they sighted something else. Someone else was in the barn with it, a man. Not a dead victim or another monster like SCP-3631-1, but an actual, living, breathing human man. MTF Epsilon-6's commander gave his squad the signal to engage. Hearing the sounds of weapons cocking around it, the creature turned and snarled, crawling on all fours like an animalistic predator. At first, it reared back. It wasn't until one member of the task force approached it that SCP-3631-1 retaliated, attacking the Foundation operatives in a frenzy. Following a prolonged and bloody exchange, MTF Epsilon-6 managed to subdue the creature and were able to once again return it to Foundation captivity. But this time, unlike back in 2005, they had SCP-3631-2 as well. As the red monster was prepped for transport, a survivor of the task force noticed something, an ID, perhaps a driver's license, on the man's person. The Epsilon-6 operative picked the card up, wiping away smears of blood with a gloved finger, enough to reveal a single, familiar name printed on it, Simon Hayes. Before long, just like last time, the Foundation rolled back out of Ombre Rouge, leaving the Louisiana townsfolk none the wiser about what had happened there. Little did they know the red shadow hanging over their home had been lifted, but it had come at the cost of a number of disappearances that would remain unsolved. People who would never be found, families forced to go on without ever getting answers. When he was returned to the Foundation's labs, SCP-3631-2 was sent for extensive examination. Given the severity of the invasive organ transplants he'd undergone, it was impossible to tell if he was, in fact, Simon. The creature had been regularly replacing the man's internal organs on a monthly basis whenever they showed signs of decay or failing, 
Somehow, despite the high risk of blood loss and infection posed by this crude form of surgery, the subject had remained alive, but he was unable to speak, conscious, but showing very limited responses to stimuli. Nobody knows why the carnivorous nocturnal monster SCP-3631-1 took this man captive. In the same vein, it is unclear why the creature felt such a need to protect him, going to such lengths as hunting for replacement organs from unwilling donors. Perhaps in a grisly, twisted way, SCP-3631-1 was this man's guardian angel, or maybe more a devil on his shoulder. I wonder, is it really possible for something to be both? Now go and check out SCP-096 The Shy Guy and SCP-049 The Plague Doctor for more tales of creepy and cruel creatures that you really don't want to have any close encounters with.